you like to know more about how pharma manufacturing works? Every month, we bring you an insider conversation with our experts here at Lonza, with our partners and leaders in the industry. Hi, my name is Martina Hestericová, and this is A View On, a podcast brought to you by Lonza. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are already part of our daily lives. Think about those personalized ads popping on your social media feeds, chatbots assisting with routine tasks and questions, or even music and streaming recommendations based on your own preferences. And how about your online banking? AI may be well implemented into our environment already, but we are still only beginning to understand its full potential. The pharmaceutical industry is also tapping into the potential of AI and machine learning algorithms, with applications ranging from big data analytics and the drug discovery and development process, to even predicting the price of drugs. Today, I want to focus on the applications of AI and machine learning, specifically in the pharma manufacturing space. To discuss this topic, I am joined by Dr. Lubna Bowarfa, the founder and CEO of Okra.ai. And to get a view from the CDMO perspective and to discuss how AI can unlock the door to continuous innovation, we are joined by Stefan Rosenberger, Lonza's head of digital transformation. So first of all, welcome Lubna. I'm very excited to have you on board today. My pleasure, Martina. and Thank you for having me. Before we dive deeper into the world of AI and machine learning, could you tell us how did you get to this area in the first place? And how did you found the company, Okra.ai? Uh, my background is in electrical engineering. That's what I did as a bachelor. And so I started on my third year um, a course called pattern recognition uh, and signal processing. And it was inspired by the way we learn as humans how to walk, how to talk, how our consciousness is developed and help us learn around our environments. Uh, I developed interest into this uh, machine learning methodologies and how can you program machines to self-learn. I actually got very passionate about how do we learn as humans, how is our perception, uh, the way we perceive visually auditory system and how we use these sensors that we have uh, in our body to uh, make an understanding, a semantical understanding of our world. That's how it started. And of course, I want to develop it somewhere with impact. And healthcare is one of the fields uh, where you can have direct impact. What makes healthcare unique for AI and ML applications? We need to learn from the past to be able to predict the future. Healthcare is the perfect industry where we can apply those algorithms that learn from the past to be able to predict the future. And what I really loved about artificial intelligence and machine learning is you learn as you go. You don't need to have to create a controlled environment like clinical trials to get to a conclusion, but you can learn the real world environment and to develop. So my first first real healthcare application was during my PhD in the operating room. The operating room itself felt like a controlled environment, even that the surgeon decides and the surgical team and the, every patient is different, but still it's semi-controlled. So and I want to bring this technology to free living environment. How can we use AI in the real world as we live it? I joined a startup in Cambridge in finance where I could see and I could work on real-time fraud detection using AI and the company scaled and I really enjoyed that. But my passion was in healthcare. Then I founded Okra late 2015. And I used the first two years when I started Okra to uh, understand what is the problems in the life science industries, how we can pivot consulting using AI in life sciences to build an AI products, AI brains. And what's the ultimate goal of your company? Our goal as Okra is to empower every organization to build their own AI brains. If you think about any company, any organization, it has a life of its own. The experiences in the past, the successes, the failures in the past. People's life is not as long as the company. Company can be hundreds of years. And this experience gets transferred in a way that is articulative. 
in the past, we've been collecting data for transactional purposes, for workflow, for HR purposes. But now we're moving to an era where we can, we're going to collect data to build our digital brains of the organization. And we use artificial intelligence that, that actually learns from a lot of unstructured data, not only in the public domain around uh, publications and clinical trials, but also the legacy data coming from the medical liaisons teams to identify those key areas and to identify the key actions for this pharmaceutical company that they need to be uh, on top of and they need to find areas to collaborate. So we use these three uh, data sources and we build this brain. Of course, it learns as a child. It starts learning from the start and, and depends on how much history you have in the organization. And then we disseminate this intelligence and this memory to support decision making. How can this AI brain be used within the organization, as you say, to support decision making? There are a lot of use cases that can be addressed once you build the brain, once you set up the memory, the learnings. You are almost building that DNA for your organization to allow to unleash the power of the human uh, workforce to do and activate re more areas for research, to drive more communication with the customers and with the patients, and to unlock areas that are lost in translation. So what you just described is applicable more towards the end of the pharma development and manufacturing process, right? When you are already running clinical trials and commercializing your product and directly interacting with patients. I wonder how would you go about designing the AI brain for an early discovery company, for instance? Uh, that's an area that at Okra we're not working at, but it's similar concepts. So as you said, at Okra, we are mostly working on the AI brain for the go-to-market from clinical trials and to the commercialization. Similarly, there are companies out there building AI brains for the early drug discovery. And what it really does is a learning from all the previous drugs and also the existing molecules and trying to identify the key molecules that will potentially become blockbuster, but then earlier in the value chain. We have huge um, scientific knowledge uh, within the organization, but to be able to simulate so many scenarios to identify the, the, the target drugs, that is something we can use machines for. That sounds amazing. But at the same time, I can imagine a lot of transformation is necessary to achieve that, right? I think it is really a new era and I feel so lucky to, to be working in this field right now, making this transition. It's not easy because it requires a lot of change management. So how are companies responding to this? Unfortunately, some organizations, they kind of struggle with that. How can we change from doing it manually within these research teams, with this process, to now um, introducing a machine that starts learning from the start as, as a baby and grows to a teenager and so forth? How can we integrate that? Uh, but it's just like any technology. For me, it's no different than when the cars came when we had the horses and then the first engines, uh, locomotives start coming. The first cars when in London start using, there was this uh, red flag act where basically uh, if you want to own a car, you need to have a man in front of the car <laughs> with a yeah. flag warning other people for 30 years. Can you imagine for 30 years? 30 years, that's unbelievable. And it took so much lobbying with the horse organizations and so much <laughs> to be able to actually to take off the flag. So it was uh, in London, there was this emancipation run where they teared the flag. And then the first time after 30 years, they could go with the cars from uh, London to Brighton. It took 30 years. And we see that. We see that when we launch new AI systems, there is always still a man with the flag someone in the organization thinking, okay, shall I let this uh, my team follow this suggestion or not? And it's a normal process, but we should not let it become a barrier. The organizations that will move faster in building their AI brains, in deploying it, and uh, simulating their teams to, uh, to work hand in hand with machines are the ones that will reap the most benefits and they will stay relevant in the transition. And uh, it will require them to upscale their workforce maybe multiple times in one generation. 
and we should not be afraid of that. We should embrace that and make even more relevant roles for our teams, the roles that can be automated. We should embrace that and the roles that uh, we, we can upskill our people to do beyond what they used to do. Yeah, I certainly hope it will not take so much time to see a wider application of AI in healthcare. But I'd like to switch gears now and talk about challenges too. I'm very curious about data sensitivity around collecting patient data. Lubna, how can we ensure that this data is not abused? I think by using it. Because if we don't, other people will reach directly to the consumers. And as we know, people are sharing everything on social media. So if you provide them with healthcare that is as fast as Uber and as fast as Airbnb, they will go for the speed and they will share everything. If we're going to move all together to a, a data-driven healthcare system, my personal data is not just my personal data. It's necessary to be able to make better uh, health decisions for you as well. And if I opt out from sharing my data, I will opt out from leveraging my data to help the others. So to me, it's really, really important and crucial to move beyond that point right now We will not compromise on privacy, yes, but we also not compromise on leveraging health data to make our healthcare system more robust and more effective and efficient. That needs to change. But in order to change, first, each organization needs to change and to leverage their own data to become smarter about it. That is the future we should be talking about. For me, if we talk ethics, I think we should also talk ethics about life without the technology. When we have this technology today and we don't leverage it, how ethical is that? If we can save life, if we can avoid people from getting sick in the first place, how ethical is that? And I think that is the debate uh, that we should be having. Really great points you're raising. Thanks for that. Now, in your experience, and I think based on where your company sits and your clients that you interact with, What do you think, how many years will it take until the majority of the sector will start applying AI principles in their work? I think uh, the good news is uh, um, they're already starting. uh, COVID has been a uh, really uh, catalyst in driving adoption of artificial intelligence. Um, When um, the face-to-face contacts, when... um, we needed more and also the speed of clinical trials that happened during COVID and people are aware we can do more and we need data. Um, of course, um, we are challenged. The, 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 the speed the algorithms are developing is, ma- is exponential. The speed of people changing their behavior is linear and that is the dichotomy. I think in the, you, we will see more adoption in the next five years. The first movers will still survive and they will flourish in the next 10 years. The late movers will struggle. And I think 20 years, we won't even talk about AI. We will have, I mean, a human force and AI agents in our organization. It will be natural. So this is my optimistic view, but we do see a really big adoption, especially the, the, the pharmaceutical companies that try to do it in-house and realized we need different types of experts engineers that um, can build this autonomous self-learning AI. And, and with them, we see the huge, um, huge adoption, uh, actually. And that's, that's really great to see. Thanks for all of your fantastic answers. I learned a lot. And I think our listeners will really appreciate your, your insights. And thanks for your time as well. My pleasure, Martina. It's really great. It's uh, it's great that we covered so many topics in such a small time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope uh, people can learn something and also open to embrace AI and embrace uncertainty in the process of building AI brains into your organization. Lovely soundbite. Guys, embrace uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thanks. And now let me introduce you to Stefan Rosenberger, the head of digital transformation here at Lonza. Welcome, Stefan. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Wonderful. Thank you for having uh, me here. So we've been discussing the applications of AI in healthcare. I mean, what a compelling topic. Isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. We see advances in the entire pharmaceutical space happening in relation to data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, as we've discussed already with Laubna. 
I wonder, how does this translate to pharmaceutical manufacturing? So data science, machine learning, AI are used today routinely in the pharmaceutical research. As an example, computer-aided drug design, we have protein profile assessment, engineering mammalian expression system with um, DNA element design, or prediction of side effects for novel therapy forms. When we look into more the small molecule space, machine learning is used for synthetic root optimization, retrosynthesis, mm -hmm. or toxicological assessment of uh, a new chemical entity, or in formulation design, machine learning is used for uh, controlled release tablets based on variables such as hardness, particle size, moisture, to predict the tablets in vitro behavior. Oh, wow. Okay. But we see also an increasing use of AI and machine learning method in different pharmaceutical manufacturing areas. So we see in the area of PAT, process analytic technology, that spectroscopical methods like Raman are used in combination with machine learning algorithm to monitor real-time critical process parameters. With a Raman inline probe, this technology combination, so PAT and machine learning, will allow to monitor metabolites and raw material concentration. And also in crystallization processes, AI methods are used in combination with PAT sensors with a, a very nice positive impact on product yield, purity, or even on specific crystallization modification. How I wish this was available when I was struggling to crystallize my proteins during my PhD studies. That sounds fantastic. Uh, could, could, have, could have been of, uh, of big help uh, yes, at that time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we, we see uh, there are quite a number of machine learning applications in the pharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, in the area of process performance monitoring, again, to gain more information out of spectroscopic data sets to increase process knowledge. But there is another aspect, another very important machine learning field in manufacturing is making predictions derived from historical data, like in predictive maintenance, using high frequency sensors, sound, vibration, or electricity consumption of assets in combination with a machine learning algorithm. Learning from past experiences, this ties nicely to what Lubna shared earlier, right? AI learning like a human being. That's amazing. Where else can this approach be applied? You can also apply the same techniques uh, for QC lab equipment like HPLCs or uh, utilities like an HVAC system for uh, for clean for clean air. So I would say data science, AI, machine learning definitely arrived in the pharmaceutical manufacturing area. That sounds amazing. But I mean, all of these applications are quite hands-on when it comes to the manufacturing process itself. Is there a possibility of using AI and machine learning also in other areas of the business, such as supply chain management or forecasting the demand of sales maybe absolutely you can i was i was more focusing now on the on the manufacturing environment but but in general the technique is is absolutely available to do much more we have to be very clear the current way how we um, organize our supply chain for example end to end will be very different using AI methods. I mean, imagine that we have the data available, how many medicines are sold on the market, which has a direct implication on the amount of material which has to be produced and the amount of APIs we have to produce and the amount of raw material we're going to ask our supplier to deliver. So this end-to-end -end view, AI can help us to understand much better and to predict much better and add another level or complexity to uh, to it, like weather. That's going to change totally the view on how you look at processes. And uh, also today, when we talk about waste management, this could be another in increasing area where AI could help us to minimize our waste. Could you summarize for our listeners how are we applying the AI and machine learning processes within Lonza? Um, as I said at the beginning, there are also in Lonza 
uh, several are the areas where uh, AI and machine learning are playing a very important role, development of synthetic routes and so on. More focusing now on the commercial manufacturing, we have a strong focus, for example, on the bio upstream processes, where we are working on machine learning algorithm in combination with Raman spectroscopy, which gives us the ability to monitor glucose level or different metabolites in bioreactor without taking manual samples, as I've said while gaining valuable process knowledge. But there are also other machine learning applications in uh, already commercial manufacturing in place, like in drying processes. And in Lonza, we are investigating the AI and machine learning application in the product technology transfer. So we have different scales. We have different equipment setups during these tech transfer. I assume the switching between scales is quite a challenge, huh? This combination is already quite a big challenge, but the number of process variables and the critical quality attributes you're going to add in addition in these tech transfer becomes another dimension. And I think the complexity of that dimension, AI and machine learning application, are predestined to provide prediction on process performance or on critical process step in such uh, technology transfers. And we also investigating in deviation management change control that we can use AI and machine learning applications um, more in a way of a transactional intelligence system to help people doing their daily work at the front. Could these processes be also applied in a training setup? Yes, there is one approach. Um, as you know, we are using virtual reality for the training of unit operations. And um, we see AI uh, together with computer vision approaches that uh, we can identify the behavior of people within a clean room, for example. And that's going to help to identify where our room for improvement, for example, without having a trainer in place. I'd like to mention to our listeners that Stefan was really kind to me a few months ago and allowed me to experience the training environment myself. And this is the reason why I ask this question. And I have to tell you the possibility to have the VR set on my head while being able to imagine, well, to really see the environment in the lab I would be trained in, I have to say, was life changing. I was able to, how could I even explain that? I <laughs> I could travel in a matter of seconds to a virtual reality where I was interacting with with an instrument that does not even exist in real life. Yet it felt like I was being trained to operate it as a real scientist on the job. And I think this, and especially in the era of COVID and the post-pandemic world will be really relevant in the pharmaceutical manufacturing space because this can really allow people to get trained on the job while not even being on the site. For instance, if they are quarantined or if the site is just being built up. It's one of the big, big advantages of this type of training, uh, train people on equipment which is not yet existing. And we, we have also good research data there that the better the training is, the less errors people are making at the shop floor. Yes. I fully understand. I remember being trained on handling highly potent compounds in the lab. And the element of fear was certainly there. And of course, people do mistakes. But I think the more you practice, this element of fear is decreasing, right? So this can really help. In a virtual environment, fail fast, learn fast is is really applicable. <laughs> yeah, that's good to hear. Wow. So this sounds really, really really exciting and yeah. and fascinating. I wonder, where do you see this space evolving in the next five to 10 years? Five to 10 years? Wow, that's, that's uh, Or quite, is it too quite... short or too long? <laughs> no, 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 too long, too long. In, too long. in a digital environment, 10 years, it's already quite long. Okay, okay. <laughs> let, me, let me try. So I think data science um, is for sure the next revolution in ph uh, pharma manufacturing in the coming years and will become a fundamental technology in all the pharmaceutical manufacturing areas. A crucial aspect in driving this AI revolution is the collection, the management, and the accessibility of process data or process 
uh, specific data, but also data generally about warehouse conditions or raw material, you name it. And I think uh, these uh, data sets are the basis for using advanced AI application in future. There will be a significant amount more of data available. And I think edge computing will help us to process these data real time at the source to steer these process. So long story short, we are at the very, very beginning of a digital revolution in pharma manufacturing. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I'm sure our listeners learned a lot about applying AI and machine learning in healthcare and pharma manufacturing, especially what's about to come in the next few years. Before we finish, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Definitely, there will be more and more uh, AI and machine learning application coming in the next year. I think we all should be not shy to really work with the uncertainty which is in front of us because uh, there are big steps to take. And I believe that as a team, we can take these big steps in the next five to 10 years. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It was a really, really insightful conversation with you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And that's all for today from A View On. This inspiring episode about AI and machine learning also brings us to the close of our second season. I hope you've enjoyed our episodes as much as I have. We will be back this fall with another season filled with exciting research, technology trends, and innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. If you haven't heard our previous episodes, go back and have a listen. You can also visit our podcast page at lonza.com to read the accompanying blogs and learn more about our speakers and their backgrounds. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Thank you.